webinar series as part of the Northern Climate Network here uh, at Northern Michigan University. I'm just absolutely thrilled and honored to introduce our guest speaker today, who is a colleague and, and somebody I, I now consider a friend whose work I, I find absolutely brilliant, um, Dr. Di Diana Lafferty, who teaches in the biology department um, in the wildlife Eco ecology and conservation science lab. She's gonna present today um, on the connections between climate change and seasonal, seasonal coat color of the snowshoe hare. Um, just by way of, of a short bio, um, Dr. Lafferty is the director of the Wildlife Ecology and Conservation, Conservation Science Lab at NMU. And she synergizes her research, mentoring, teaching, and extension efforts to maximize participation by diverse people in authentic science to advance in our understanding of how wildlife populations respond to global change. In this pursuit, her research is taxonomically and geographically diverse. In addition, she often integrates macro and micro ecological perspectives using a mix of natural history observations, field-based monitoring, myriad laboratory techniques, statistical modeling, bioinformatics analyses, and citizen science to answer questions of social and ecological interest for the purpose of contributing to positive conservation outcomes. Um, for those of you who know Dr. Lafferty, you know that in addition to being a prolific scholar, um, she's also such a, a passionate member of our community and stands up to many um, causes that she cares about and has such a great relationship with her students. And so both personally and professionally, I'm honored to introduce Dr. Lafferty um, today for her presentation in our webinar series. Thank you so much for coming. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. That was a very nice introduction. Um, am I able to share my screen? Yes. Okay. Can uh, I share my screen? No. Yes, let me. So, yeah. yep. There you go. Perfect. Can. Okay. Does that work? Can you guys all see my slides? Great. So I just wanted to begin today by sharing with you a little bit about my motivation, um, which is the idea that understanding how wildlife populations, as well as their associated and communities, respond to environmental change is really essential um, for developing science-informed strategies to help conserve Earth's biodiversity. However, as this extinction crisis continues to grow, I also recognize that science alone isn't going to save species from extinction and that we really need public support and participation across all demographics if we're going to achieve socially just and ecologically relevant conservation outcomes. So I really believe that the intentional inclusion of people with diverse knowledge, experiences, and identities in the conservation ecology pipeline is really a requisite for creating a more just world for all of the people in the wildlife that share our planet. And with that in mind, um, in my role as a faculty member and as the principal investigator in the Wildlife Ecology and Conservation Science Lab, it's my personal responsibility to be both a vocal and a visible advocate for justice, equity, diversity, advancement, and inclusion, which we call the JEDI principles. And I do this in the work that I do in my lab, in my classroom, in my institution, and in my community. And I really think that by prioritizing these JEDI principles in my research and mentoring and outreach and teaching, I'm able to demonstrate to my students, to my colleagues, my collaborators, and hopefully my administrators, that I really value the perspectives that marginalized groups bring to our shared pursuit of rigorous conservation ecology, relevant to our diverse society. Um, it's also my responsibility to help educate my team of students to understand the barriers that many people face from underrepresented and underserved communities in higher education, and particularly the impact that systemic racism has in the STEM fields and the ramifications of that implicit and explicit bias that is still present in academia 
and what it means for me and many of us to have privilege so that we can use that platform to create a more engaging learning environment through effective allyship. And this includes continuing education on my part and helping my team recognize that diversity is not always visible and that's okay too. Not everyone wears buttons and badges to display their different demographics and affiliations to which they belong. And it's not possible to identify a lot of people, race, ethnicity, gender, um, their veteran status, um, unless they fit some preconceived notion or stereotype, which further contributes to this uneven playing field. Um, so we spend a lot of time with one another sharing ideas and learning um, and hopefully making a more inclusive lab space. And I really think that it's my commitment to these JEDI principles that's enabled me to establish this really conceptually rich and highly collaborative wildlife ecology and conservation science research group here at Northern that includes diverse students and collaborators from across the country and around the world. That my program really celebrates human diversity as a resource, strength, and benefit. And that the students and collaborators with whom I work feel a sense of belonging and community, knowing that they're valued and their contributions are acknowledged. And I hope that by demonstrating my commitment to the JEDI principles, that it's not just the broader impacts of what I do, but it's standard operating procedure. And with that, we can help shift the culture of STEM to one that is a better representation of human diversity. And while all my research is rooted in global environmental change from the impacts of radiation contamination on the gut microbiome of Japanese wild boar across Fukushima um, to changes in recreation patterns influencing wildlife space use, physiological stress or food habits. Um, but today I'm gonna highlight some of the creative collaborative climate change focused research that's happening in my lab and share with you how I use this research as a gateway for intentional inclusivity by providing opportunities for really diverse students to get engaged in authentic global change science. <clears throat> so today I'm gonna to be focusing on the color of the bunny. And this is where I'm gonna to talk to you a bit about some of the research I've been involved with, with a diverse international team of scientists um, that span the academic hierarchy from undergraduates to seasoned professors, all of whom are focused on understanding how climate change may affect Earth's biodiversity, particularly seasonal coat color changing species like the snowshoe hare. And to help orient you to our model systems, um, which can broadly be characterized as environmental mismatch and seasonal coat color changing species like the snowshoe hare that's shown in this picture. Um, it's important to know that the timing of coat color molt is geographically variable for about 20 species around the world, from hares to ptarmigans to weasels to arctic fox, and that seasonal color molt is a photo period timed cue that's confronting one of the strongest signals of climate change, which is a reduction in the duration of winter snow extent. And this rapid reduction in winter snow extent is shown here in this bar chart. Um, and this is from the Rutgers Snow Lab in which there's been a really strong decline in the millions of kilometers of snow extent in the Northern hemisphere over the last 50 years. And it's this reduction in winter snow extent that's leading to environmental mismatch amongst seasonal coat color changing species in their environment, leaving some species particularly vulnerable to predation. In one of the best studied predator prey cycles in the world, you're probably familiar with this to some extent, is that relationship between lynx and snowshoe hare. And the long history of research on lynx and snowshoe hare demonstrates that snowshoe hare are under very strong selection pressure to avoid mortality due to predation and that snowshoe hare have population dynamics that are driven by mortality inflicted by Canada lynx, as well as a diverse array of other predators, while also influencing their own food group. In fact, snowshoe hare are strong biotic interactors through their relationship with both their predators and their own prey. And in fact, snowshoe hare are sometimes referred to as the cheeseburger of the forest because everything eats them. 
Um, they're the preferred prey for everything from Canada lynx to great horned owls to coyotes and wolverines. So again, they're under really strong selective pressure to avoid predation. And this is perhaps why, despite being a really common species across much of their range, that snowshoe hare serve as a really excellent model for examining the impacts of climate change on a seasonal coat color changing species. For example, Marquetta Zamova, uh, one of the PhD students on our team whose dissertation focused on this issue, she found that snowshoe hare survival decreased by about 7% a week as their contrast to their environment increased. And with her data, she was also able to do some population modeling. And based on those data, it suggests that that 7% decline in population with mismatch is enough to result in population collapse for many populations that are subjected to that extent of um, snow and seasonal change. And yet we still know really very little about whether or not um, snowshoe hare might have the ability to successfully respond to mismatch through some type of physiological plasticity in coat color or through behavioral plasticity. But one thing we do know from ecological first principles is that wildlife populations are going to respond in one of three ways to rapid climate change. They're going to move, they're going to adapt, or they're going to die. And it's this middle option, this potential for local adaptation through plasticity and phenology or behavior, or perhaps through natural selection that is really poorly understood and it's seldom um, considered in the context of climate change or in conservation planning. And it's this paucity of knowledge that really led our research team to pursue these conceptually fun ideas um, that we're really hoping are gonna help inform future conservation planning. So for example, um, the maintenance of biodiversity in a rapidly changing climate will in part depend on the e efficiency to which environmental rescue, whereby populations decline due to abrupt environmental change can be reversed or mitigated in genetically driven adaptive traits. However, a lack of traits known to be under direct selection by anthropogenic climate change has really limited the incorporation of evolutionary processes into global conservation efforts. Um, but because decreased uh, seasonal slow duration is one of the most persistent and widespread signals of climate change, and it results from field studies show how these winter white mismatched animals against a barren ground suffer really high fitness costs due to that increased predation pressure. Um, the absence of evolutionary shifts in these species could result in potential population declines across many trophic levels. So using this coat color mismatch, um, we were able to examine potential global hotspots where we might be able to apply evolutionary rescue from climate change. So here we sampled nearly 3,000 geo-referenced museum specimens of known winter coat color from eight different species across different trophic levels. And we identified environmentally driven clinal gradients in winter coat color, including these polymorphic zones where winter brown and winter white morphs of these seasonal coat color changing species co-occur. And if you're a little bit shocked to learn that these seasonal coat color changing species occur in multiple winter color morphs, I want you to look closely at the map um, so that you can look and see if there's any patterns that you think might exist across species in regards to where these polymorphic zones seem to occur. So for example, if you take a look at the top map showing the distribution of snowshoe hare, across most of their range, all of the animals molt to winter white is indicated by that dark blue on the map that corresponds to the high probability that animals are going to be white in the winter. But also notice there's some subpopulations along the west coast in which both winter white and winter brown polymorphs co-occur. Um, consider the climate in the Pacific Northwest. There's ephemeral seasonal snow 
It creates an environmental mosaic of white and brown like a winter patchwork, sometimes fluctuating on a daily basis with the warm winter off the Pacific Ocean. So both winter white and winter brown polymorphs are subject to selection pressure due to this highly variable environment in which the conditions are consistently changing. And it's these polymorphic zones that hold a lot of genetic diversity within the seasonal coat color changing species. And they harbor those animals that exhibit this variation in that trait that is under direct selection of climate change. So to identify these polymorphic hotspots that foster potential for evolutionary rescue, we converted those continuous probabilities of individuals being winter white versus winter brown into these polymorphic zones using two different criteria. First, we used a broad criteria um, that we defined as animals in the area having between about a 20 and an 80% probability of being winter white. But then we also used a narrow criteria that we defined as animals having between about a 40 and 60% probability of being winter white. And depending upon which species criteria we are using, those polymorphic zones comprised between one to 57% of the species range. So depending on the species and snow duration, a plausible reduction of 30 to 50 days of seasonal snow cover this century would require many of the winter white populations to become polymorphic, so both brown and white exist, and those polymorphic populations to become winter brown in order to maintain their optimal winter coat colors to blend in with their environment. Now, next, we combined those polymorphic zones for the eight species that we had enough data to look at to identify regions in which multi-polymorphic species co-occur. So although under the broad criteria, two or more species shared these putative polymorphic zones across a lot of the Northern Hemisphere, and that's shown in map A on the top in B, and the narrow criteria, multi-species polymorphic zones were limited to just a few regions in North America, and that's shown in figure C at the bottom and figure D for Great Britain. And those polymorphic zones across those eight species, um, they help us identify regions that currently hold a disproportionately high potential to initiate evolutionary rescue from camouflage mismatch in that fitness relevant trait that's affected by climate change. <clears throat> so in addition to being this hot spot for in situ evolutionary rescue, um, the areas might also facilitate gene flow and adaptive alleles to those monomorphic populations. So currently protected areas only cover about 13% of the world's terrestrial land surface <clears throat> and multi-species polymorphic zones, which we termed active climate mediated evolution zones or ACME zones are really poorly represented by existing protected area networks. And that's just shown here in this really simple table. So even under our really broad criteria, um, where we're thinking about that 20 to 80%, um, only about 5% of these multi-species polymorphic zones um, in the most strict, strict protected areas um, are actually there as designated by the IUCN, so the International Union on the Convention of Nature. And for all six of the IUCN categories of protected areas, when those are all combined, they only embrace about 10% of the multi-species um, acme zones, which means that uh, there's not a lot of protection for these evolutionary rescue hotspots. So the broad geographic range of these seasonal color molting species and their role as flagship species, you know, strongly interacting species that include prey and predators, they amplify the value of understanding how climate mediated evolution might foster the persistence um, of some species in the face of climate change. Failed adaptation by these species could have both direct and indirect impacts that might reverberate throughout their ecosystems. And because the co-distributed species make up these multi-species polymorphic zones represent both predators like the weasels and the Arctic fox, as well as their prey like hare and lemmings, and differential molt responses in different species might exacerbate those fitness costs 
creating these cascading evolutionary outcomes. But this is also why we think that mismatch in seasonal coat color provides this really striking visual metaphor for how climate change may affect biodiversity and that regions that contain these co-occurring winter polymorphs are conservation relevant. And we hope to apply this evolutionary rescue idea to aid species that are confronting Earth's rapidly changing climate. And our framework that we use to identify these zones to enhance potential to initiate evolutionary rescue from climate change could be applied to other polymorphisms and other morphological or physiological or behavioral traits that are affected by climate change. And our hope is that identification of these hot spots for evolutionary rescue will give us some novel opportunities to integrate evolutionary processes into future conservation planning, which has really been lacking up to this point. So in addition to this exciting global polymorphic hotspot and evolutionary rescue initiative, um, we were also interested in looking at some other aspects of um, seasonal coat color changing evolution and ecology. So we've been pursuing some genetic research as well to understand the genetic basis for these observed coat color polymorphisms, specifically in snowshoe hair. So to dissect the genetic basis for polymorphic seasonal coat color change in snowshoe, we used whole genome sequencing from winter white hairs in Montana and winter brown hairs in Washington. And we constructed a reference collection through an iterative mapping project with the rabbit genome. And we use sequences from two regions in the Pacific Northwest that are polymorphic zones, as well as a monomorphic winter white locality in Montana. Um, and this helped us get the basis that we needed for reference collections. <clears throat> Additionally, we sampled animals from our captive colony um, and we sampled those animals across the molting period to examine changes in gene expression during the actual molt. So these results from the study reveal that it's this cis regulatory variation controlling seasonal expression in the agouti gene. And the agouti gene is that brown gene um, that turns and codes for color molting. And it underlies the adaptive winter camouflage um, polymorphism that we see in snowshoe hair. In more digestible terms, we found genetic variation at this agouti site um, by winter white across multiple hair populations and jackrabbit species. Um, and this revealed this really interesting recurrent history of gene flow and hybridization between snowshoe hair and black-tailed jackrabbits. So it was this introgression, this hybridization between snowshoe and jackrabbits that introduced that winter brown gene into this population. And while this was pretty exciting science, um, and it was fun to be part of these really high impact um, initiatives, um, much of the joy that I get from doing this global change work with snowshoe hair is that I get to work with a lot of really diverse students and we get to pursue a lot of really fun projects. Um, and that includes things um, like developing our toolbox um, so that we can answer some more direct questions about the morphology, the physiology and the behavioral response of snowshoe hair to climate change. Um, for example, my students and I have conducted a series of controlled experiments that have laid the foundation for some of our field studies. Um, and it's been really fun to get to engage with them at that level and get them involved in some really fun science. For example, in regards to snowshoe hair morphology, Obtaining accurate data on the phenological processes, such as the timing of seasonal coat color mort in wild populations is really difficult. It's very expensive and it's very time consuming. But here we conducted a controlled experiment at the captive snowshoe hair facility at Fort Missoula to measure the progression of seasonal molts in the snowshoe hair. And we evaluated the accuracy of our trained observers to classify the stage of the molt from camera trap images and identify factors that increase the accuracy of using camera traps 
in order to measure and monitor molt phenology. And our results showed that images taken by remote camera can be used to classify the stage of the molt with relatively high accuracy, about 84%. And our observers achieved the highest accuracy when using a classification protocol with fewer categories. And that's what's shown here on the top where um, it's not quite as refined as down here, um, which was a little bit more difficult um, for observers to be able to classify into those five categories accurately. We also found that hair body position in the images and whether the hair was moving or still had some small influences on the observer's classification and accuracy. Camera model was negligible, which is really great because many camera trap studies are going on around the world and images of species um, can be used from a variety of cameras. So it doesn't matter if you're using a $700 Reconyx camera or a $35 Cuddybuck camera, um, we can still use those data in order to classify those snowshoe hair um, according to their molt stages. So in much of the same way that remote cameras have revolutionized the study of the distribution abundance and behavior of some animal populations, so too can remote cameras transform our understanding of these key phenological processes across space and time for these seasonal coat color changing species so we can refine our understanding of how climate change is impacting them. In regards to snowshoe hair physiology, I've been working with undergraduates and graduate student researchers to calibrate several non-invasive sampling tools that we can use to evaluate snowshoe hair physiological stress responses relative to their environmental mismatch. And just to give you a really simplified perspective on the physiological stress response, <clears throat> this is often referred to as the fight or flight response. And this is that physiological cascade that begins when an animal detects a threat to survival or some kind of conflict. The brain processes that signal by releasing adrenocorticotropin hormone, and that stimulates the release of both cortisol and adrenaline. And it's that cortisol or its metabolites that are often used to index stress in a variety of domestic um, species, as well as free ranging wildlife. And in fact, fecal glucocorticoid metabolites or fecal cortisol metabolite concentrations are increasingly being used to non-invasively index stress experienced by diverse wildlife. Although feces is relatively abundant, um, we can often collect it non-invasively. Um, it may end up being exposed to a variety of elements, both biotic and abiotic. So the, um, the microorganisms in the environment, once it's been defecated, the abiotic environment, heat, sunshine, um, precipitation, and these are all things that can influence our ability to um, measure those fecal cortisol concentrations. So although methodological studies aren't particularly exciting science, um, these are really important and they've laid the foundation for our ongoing work in Washington, Oregon, and Montana. And they gave lots of students opportunities to participate on these um, initiatives and see how you can conduct ecological experiments. Um, for instance, using two different sampling when you're out in the field, do you need to pick up an entire fecal mass? Um, do you need all of those pellets or can you grab, you know, three to five pellets? And is that sufficient for being able to measure um, fecal cortisol within snowshoe hair feces. Um, and the results of our study were able to tell us that, yeah, actually by collecting about five samples, five pellets, that is sufficient. Um, and your accuracy is spot on with using that whole fecal mass. So by knowing that we can save a lot of time and money in the field by not searching down every single fecal pellet that we find on a transect. Um, we've also been looking at things like how does time, temperature, and precipitation affect our ability to measure fecal cortisol metabolites, and does it affect the quality of that signal? And again, what we learned from that study shown here in this red box 
is it sampling snowshoe hare and likely many other herbivores during cool, dry conditions, we get a more stable signal over as much as a five day period. So that really changes the way we can do field-based sampling because we don't have to go out and sample every single day. We can end up clearing a transect and going out as long as five days later to pick up all of those pellets, which gives us a lot more flexibility with field time, especially when we're working in relatively rugged conditions. And most recently, I've been leading an initiative to experimentally test whether snowshoe hair personality can facilitate their adaptation to climate change. And I know what you're thinking, oh my God, she really is a bunny hugger, um, which is not entirely untrue, but in behavioral ecology terms, animal personality is defined as a repeatable difference in behavior across time and context. So I set out to evaluate whether snowshoe hares exhibit repeatable differences in their behavior and whether those behaviors are influenced by their background color, which determines their fitness relevant camouflage and to assess whether or not those behaviors are temporarily plastic. So do they change over the course of the day? And what I found was that snowshoe hair do exhibit significant repeatabilities in several behaviors that are associated with risk-taking behavior, such as their activity levels, their location within our experimental setup, which is referred to as an open field apparatus, as well as their preferences for being matched to their background, which aids in crypsis or their camouflage. So their activity levels and their open field preference, so being in the interior of this open field versus the exterior of this open field, um, those were significant and they were repeatable over time with animals consistently preferring to be in the outer portion of the open field, which is considered safer because their back is against the wall, they have better visuals for everything going on in front of them versus out in the center where they are more vulnerable to predation, particularly by aerial predators. And it was nice to know that our experimental setup um, paralleled what we have seen with snowshoe hair behavior in the field, letting us know that our apparatus was working for our intent to evaluate whether or not they were or were not preferring to be matched to their background environment. <clears throat> now, we did find significant individual differences um, in their, their preference for matching to their background as well. And animals exhibited a preference at the population level for being matched to their background. Of course, there were some animals that seemed oblivious to their mismatch or exhibited no preference. Um, not surprisingly, those did tend to be male. Um, which are known to occasionally put themselves at greater risk for predation. We also found that females, particularly larger bodied females, spent more time in the shelters than did any of the other um, individuals within the study. <clears throat> so there appears to be some, some slight sex-based differences in location preference as well as in your, your preferences for matching to their background. And while this let us know that at least during their summer brown phase, snowshoe hair exhibit a preference for matching to that brown background, our next step in this ladder is to do the opposite and to look at our winter white hairs and see whether or not they also exhibit a preference for that brown background or do they exhibit a preference for that white background so that we can see whether or not that behavior is <clears throat> consistent over time. And you can imagine if white snowshoe hair exhibit a preference for brown background year round, um, it's not really a great idea. Um, they will be selected against, but it will be those animals, those individuals that don't, that will likely survive and populate into the future. So again, these are just laying some of the foundations so that we can tease apart some of these ideas. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> it's been really, really fun to work with this fairly diverse team of researchers from around the world <clears throat> covering multiple continents 
and having the opportunity to tick away at seasonal coat color change and mismatch from a behavioral, a genetic, a morphological, and a physiological perspective. This multifaceted approach has been really, really fun um, as we all get to draw on our strengths and learn from one another. But the real joy that I get in pursuing this research are the incredible students and undergraduate workers on these projects because none of the research that we do would be possible without the contributions of these undergraduate researchers. They dedicate an enormous amount of time and energy to lab work, database management, video analysis that would drive anybody insane, but they do it with a, a happy heart and enthusiasm that's incredible. And it's with their contributions that we're able to do so many of these projects. Um, but we, I hope we're not the only ones that are benefiting. Um, the students are certainly getting to develop their professional networks as they connect with researchers in Italy and Portugal and Austria and across the United States in these efforts. The students are also um, contributors and co-authors to many of the research projects or products that we produce. Um, for example, um, there are undergraduate student co-authors on all four of these papers. And we have three additional manuscripts in the pipeline, one of which is currently in review. Our students have also presented at the celebration of student scholarship and have been co-authors on presentations at multiple national conferences. Um, several of these students have gone on to graduate school, which are shown parenthetically in that list. And I anticipate that many more of these students will likely pursue graduate studies as well. And I really do believe that creating a conceptually rich research environment in which I am visibly and vocally engaged in diversity advancement and inclusion makes it possible for me to recruit students into my research lab from a broader range of backgrounds than what is possible through passive adoption of undergraduate volunteers. Um, by intention, my diverse team of students not only contribute to fun and exciting global change science, um, but they're helping to create and maintain an innovative and really productive community in which we help each other gain greater, gain greater cultural competency, through the open exchange of ideas and experiences in the hopes of shifting academic culture, particularly STEM culture, to one that is a better representative of our society. <clears throat> um, and with that, um, I would just leave you with um, my lab website and the ideas that we are pursuing and I would be happy to um, take any of your questions about our ongoing snowshoe hair or bunny research. Um, some of the scientists call it snowshoe hair. Most of us have adopted the bunny approach, um, um, although not everybody loves it. Um, but I'd be happy to take any questions at this point. Thank you so much for such a fascinating research talk, Diana. Does anyone have any questions for her? I know I have two questions, but, but that can wait. Uh, Diana, thank you so much. You are such an all-star. Oh my goodness. Can I just say how lucky, how fortunate NMU is to have you here, the work that you're doing, um, and especially with students, just the opportunity that you're able to provide our undergrads is world-class, like world-class. Um, one question that I had was, how did you get involved? How did it um, you become part of this team? It sounds like this project has been going on for several years now. And I was just wondering where your point of entry was. Um, my point of entry was accidental. Um, as I, I reached out to Dr. Scott Mills at NC State uh, regarding postdoc opportunities, 
because my background uh, is stable isotope biogeochemistry and stress physiology. And he was excited to have somebody come on with the stress physiology component because they didn't have anybody that did hormone and endocrinology work with wildlife. So that was an opportunity to provide value added to some of their ongoing work um, and to calibrate some of the metrics that they needed for some of the field study side. So I came on board back in 2015 after I finished my dissertation um, and just hit the ground running. And we've had a, a really fun, prolific um, collaborative group. We've gone on to work on additional projects beyond the snowshoe hair, although we, we still have a silly amount of snowshoe hair projects that are ongoing um, and exhausting. Diana, maybe you could talk a little bit more about how you have integrated citizen science into this project or some of your other projects. Yeah, the citizen science component with the snowshoe hares is just taking off as we're expanding our global data set for seasonal coat color changing species. Until we had a workable protocol that could be deployed for multiple species for scoring those animals, um, it wasn't possible to use uh, camera images from around the world. But now that we have our protocols refined, um, they've been published and accepted and now they're being used for a variety of species. So we're able to have people from anywhere that have camera trap images of, we really, really like to get um, mismatched molters. So when you see mismatched hares or weasels or ptarmigan, um, if, if you're in places where you see Arctic fox, that'd be great too. Um, but we love to get those kinds of images and we do have um, feelers out on a variety of listservs and citizen science platforms where we're collecting those kinds of data as they come in. And because you can use any kind of camera to do that, like we're not bound to a particularly high quality camera, um, we can use data collected from Jim Bob's farm across the street or from a scientist at another institution. Those are equally valuable. I see a number of my students in the audience and I'm not above nudging them to ask you a question. Hey, Dr. Lafferty, I, uh, I have a question for you. So um, I think that the research that you do is really interesting with the snowshoe hares and being able to see um, this very visible example of how climate change is morphologically and physiologically affecting these wildlife. Um, but I've seen other research um, uh, there's a scientist that goes out and records um, bird song in city parks all over the country. Um, and over the decades, he's been able to track the decline of birds in city parks. And so I'm just wondering if, are you familiar with any other examples of large scale studies like the one that you're currently involved with that um, are using animal species as an indicator of climate change? So amphibians still tend to be one of the big indicator species for climate change. Um, and there are some global initiatives, uh, particularly with um, disease dynamics associated with climate change and how we're seeing um, the ecological envelope shift to further north with things like BD and chytrid fungus. And so we're seeing increased prevalence with amphibians um, around the world with increasing elevation and increasing latitude um, associated with climate change. And that's run out of a group at UMass. That's one of the other sort of big global initiatives. It's not necessarily a climate trait per se, um, but it's that interaction between climate and diseases um, that's being looked at. Um, that's the first one that comes to mind. 
Uh, I know there, there's a global initiative um, with like camera trappers in general that's being headed out of the Smithsonian and the North Carolina Museum of Natural, Natural Sciences that's looking at human impacts, not specifically climate change per se, um, but human impacts on wildlife space use and distributions. And they are, I mean, there is a climate component because cities function as heat islands and those heat islands select for smaller bodied organisms. So, and they also select for generalists over specialists. So we're seeing a shift in functional traits in species as we get more synanthropic um, species, those city dwellers that are more tolerant. So you see like, you know, a lot of your corvids do really well in and around humans. Um, some of our songbirds do, but certainly not all of them. Um, White-footed mice do great. Um, kangaroo rats, not so much. So we see some of those dynamics happening um, at global scales. And that's made possible, again, by a lot of large-scale citizen science, the camera trapping projects, where people can ask those questions, because no one scientific group can afford any of those projects on their own. Great, thanks. Sure. I've got a question. This is John O'Brien. Um, so at the beginning, you mentioned that, uh, you know, understanding this problem um, isn't necessarily gonna solve it and that we need, um, you know, actual solutions to take care of the problem of climate change. And so I just wanted to understand, you know, right now we're at maybe a degree Celsius of temperature rise globally on average or so. And, you know, the Paris Accord wants us to get down, you know, limit the warming to only 1.5 degrees. But if we're already seeing these problems right now, do we, I mean, and we're, we're likely the way that we're going to overshoot that, um, you know, two degrees maybe, but uh, hopefully if we can stay down to just 1.5 degrees, is that gonna be, you know, are we still pretty bad off? Do we really need to be down to what some people like um, Eric Toensmeyer, uh, drawdown fellow and author of The Carbon Farming Solution, um, he says it's technically feasible uh, to actually be less warm than we are now, maybe six tenths of a degree. Um, you know, that was maybe like a four, four year old uh, scenario that he, when he mentioned that, but um, so are, are we, is, is it your sense that we're, we're too far gone to, to avoid some of these issues? And, um, you know, what, what would your ideal scenario uh, for, for climate change be at this point? Well, I will not speak to the, the I will stay in my lane a little bit because um, I would not classify myself as a climate scientist. But I do think the, the population declines that we're already seeing, for example, in our coat color mismatched animals are pretty severe, um, especially on the lagging edge. So on their more Southern ranges is where we're seeing those big impacts. Um, that's likely going to get substantially worse um, before it gets any better. And we might see some pretty big catastrophic declines in populations and those can amplify through a food web. Um, with a snowshoe hare, although they're currently common, um, if you kill off a whole bunch of snow through snowshoe hare from predation pressure, um, they may or may not come back in some of those areas and that has ramifications for other endangered species like the Canada lynx. So we'll see that percolate through those food webs. Um, whether or not like the trajectory we're on can possibly be bounded and we can roll that back. I certainly hope so. Um, I think that's what a lot of us are hoping with citizen engagement and with elected officials that will make decisions that are forecasting into the future instead of focusing on the immediate gratification that they would like to have in their bank accounts. Um, so I hope by working together across communities locally and across 
populations around the world that as a citizenry we are going to come together we all are kind of stuck to each other um so everyone's decision affects someone else and until we start really taking that home and all recognizing that we're all part of the problem and the solution um we're not going to see much of the effects change so i hope we're not past that tipping point but based on who you ask some people think we are. A lot of scientists think that there's still opportunities for um, some mitigation that can be really effective. So I'm not gonna live long enough to see some of it. Some of you might though. I guess on that point, Dr. Lafferty, does your lab or this project make any recommendations for conservation of these species? We do. We're actually pretty fortunate. Um, Scott Mills, the PI, um, he was on the 2007 Nobel Prize winning IPCC group um, for climate change. So he's pretty well connected policy wise um, across um, the United States and with our partners in Europe. Um, we have really great connections with policymakers um, at both state and um, federal levels. Um, so that means integrating and interfacing with pred predominantly forest managers. Um, we've done some other projects that I didn't highlight that deal specifically with forest management processes um, because changing in forest structure changes the amount of snow that makes it to the ground. It also changes your insulation and radiation, um, which all affects how much snow cover stays. So. Uh, we've been looking at that angle as well and how we can better manage our forests to protect some of those species to keep more snow um, and keep more reflectance happening. Um, and they've been very, very well received. Um, you know, evolutionary rescue is kind of an incendiary topic because often, you know, you're considered to be playing God um, when you move animals around the landscape or when you move genes around the landscape. Um, but it's certainly not particularly novel. We've done it lots of times. Um, the transfer of Texas cougars into Florida to save the Florida panther. Um, you know, we've done it multiple times where we've chosen to protect functionality of a system and, you know, keep our fingers crossed that our, our, our playing God has the positive effects that we hope for. And it doesn't always. Um, but some of that will go to the vote, right? The people get a choice in making those decisions, just like they did this week with Colorado approving reintroduction of wolves. Um, you know, for the longest time, it's been illegal for a wolf to exist in the state of Colorado under governor rule. And this year, like the vote just came back that they want them back. So I think a lot of that will be up to the people to decide whether or not we can or can't apply evolutionary tools um, to help and aid conservation to climate change. Um, we'll see. Thank you so much, Dr. Lafferty, for coming. Um, we've all been really looking forward to this talk for so many months, and you did not dis disappoint. Um, and just to echo what Jess said, you're a force of nature and NMU and the Marquette area, and certainly all the people you collaborate with are better off for, for uh, interacting with you. So thank you so much for joining. And for all of you to, to attend this webinar in a very chaotic week, very busy week, certainly. Um, I hope you all have a great next couple months. Um, this is our last event for the semester, but please join us on January 22nd, where we'll be um, having a, another webinar with Sumit Vij uh, from Wageningen University of the Netherlands, talking about gender and climate change adaptation. So stay tuned. I'll be sure to flood your inboxes with invites as we have many more events coming up in the spring.